What's important? What do you want? Let me say again, thank you for coming, especially those of you who just shown up. I want to thank you very much for joining us. And I'd like to invite you to start with what I call the extraordinary listening breath. The way we distinguish it, especially for those of you new, is if I asked you to take a deep breath, everybody I think can do that pretty clearly, and everybody's pretty clear when you are breathing. And then I'd say if I told you not to breathe, don't not breathe, just don't breathe, and watch, you'll notice there's a breath going on. And what I'd ask you to do is listen to the impulse to breathe. First notice it, and if you can't feel it, just don't breathe for a minute, and you'll feel immediately that there's, um, very shortly, there's something going on that, that breathes whether you think you're breathing or not. And if you'll listen to that impulse, and listen to it means breathe in perfect harmony with it. When it wants you to breathe in, breathe in. Breathe in at the speed to the depth that it wants. And then I would ask as we start to develop a vocabulary together to explore into what we're doing here. Is that you breathing or is that not you? And if the other one was you, and this is you breathing too, which you am I talking to? Which you do you think you are? This discrepancy or division or separation between the conscious aspect and this deeper aspect of self is what I would consider to be the essence of Aikido. The ability to recognize two aspects at once and to bring them into a unified field. So I would say harmony, like charity, begins at home. How are we doing? I, I know some of you have not worked with me before and um, you should get already, I'm fairly informal. And uh, as I've often said, I, I really don't consider myself a teacher. I'm just a student. Maybe I'm more advanced than some of you and as such I can be of service. But I'm still learning. I'm basically in an inquiry into what this is all about. I suppose there may have been some point where I thought Aikido was about learning how to do the techniques, Ikkyo and Arimi Nage and Shiho Nage, and that that's learning Aikido. I don't know that that was ever actually true, but I wouldn't doubt there were some moments where I had that kind of a thought. But I now distinguish learning that aspect of the art, and it is a part of it, but it's only a part. I call that aspect Aikiwaza, the techniques of Aiki. If you work in harmony with another person's body, those movements are going to show up. But that the study itself is something much more quintessential. And so the techniques are kind of like the breath we do that we know. But somewhere at a deeper level, there's a breathing going on that is our connection to the universal force. And how we relate to that is the process of Aikido. And whether our Aikido is good or not is really based very much on the breath. And when we say Kokyu, most people think of the <sighs> breath, what we would call the external breathing. But that again is just uh, one of the technical aspects of breathing because if you start to breathe in and follow the breath all the way to the top, kind of use your volition to add to the extraordinary listening part of the breath, get to the top of the breath, all you have to do is release and it starts to breathe you and it'll exhale to about halfway or two-thirds of the way and if you'll add your volition to the exhale, you can breathe all the way out to the bottom of the breath, at which point, if you simply release, air comes in, it breathes you. And 
If you let it do that, it'll come in about half or two-thirds of the way, and if you add your volition to it, take it all the way to the top of the breath, then all you have to do is release, and you notice it's breathing you. If you're not with me, if you have a question, if there's anything I can do to help you understand this more or better, don't be shy, unmute your mic and shout, because <laughs> I've got my earphone a little bit out of my ear, so I don't hear the echo too much. And I call this the Aiki dance breath. This is where you start unifying the intentional volition with what I might call your bestowed mission, with the origins of the force of life within you, with that which calls you, which is the universal force of life itself. And often in our life, as we get involved in our daily process, including our ikkyos and nikkyos, cooking our food, finding our way somewhere, doing our work, we kind of lose touch with that original source. And relinking with that or reconnecting with that is our process of bringing these two aspects of self, the known and the unknown, into harmony. And once they actually blend to a perfection, a power shows up, an unknown force, as O-sensei called it. So listening to the impulse to breathe and recognizing your ability to participate with it and I think you should be starting to feel that there's something that happens as those two come into unification. I don't exactly want to say you unify them, but if we're speaking about both of the two aspects of you coming together as one then I would say that you. So, depends on who I'm talking to. Everybody with me? All right. I think that it's common, and please do stop me if you'd like to. I think it's common for people to misunderstand, and certainly in the beginning, and, and people who don't seek O-sensei's Aikido, but just came into a dojo where somebody's repeating techniques. To understand Aikido as a collection of techniques, and when you've learned all the uh, techniques, you've learned Aikido. But I would say it's the way of harmony with the energy of the universe. And if it's working well, then you're able to handle things like the changes that are taking place in our lives right now, for which Nikkyo has very little value. All right, so I think this unification of these aspects of the self are a doorway or a way to understand the practice as working with our uke is a way to understand the practice by feeling the connection with them and when we're in harmony and our motion is working well we can tell and that's why it's nice to have an uke but if you don't have one and I'm assuming most of you at the moment don't and in general um, what is it that this practice that we've been doing is about so I'm going to add just a couple things to the review of the breathing exercises we've done. And I know for those of you who are new, I'm going to move really quickly. Again, there are notes that are up on the createabeautifulworld.org website. And I think most of you have my email. And uh, you can reach us either through the website or email me direct. And I'm happy to do anything I can to help with the understanding of this because I think for a lot of people they're not introduced to it this way and so it may be a little bit of a bridge to jump but that's where we're going today so we did the extraordinary listening breath if I had one thing I could teach you it would be that it's the one simplest exercise that immediately starts to unify the known aspect of self and the unknown aspect of self the individual with the universal, the mind with the body, the masculine and feminine, the creative and receptive natures. 
and is recognizing this balance between these two forces and bringing them together. O sensei said one plus one equals one. And all the practices we do should be working on that. Uh, and I, I think the misunderstandings that go on in terms of it seeing the martial side is that people think that they're supposed to be able to dominate an uke. And again, whatever aspect interests you, whatever you want to study, please uh, do what's right for you. Do what your inner teacher or higher self or connection with the divine calls you to do. I think of it as the Aikikami, my studying with the Aikikami. And um, I've always considered myself a direct student of the Aikikami. And so, I, like I say, everyone, all the teachers I've studied with are what we would call senior, as I consider myself, just senior to those of you who are junior and uh, we do what we can to help each other along the path but I would say never abandon your inner teacher when something doesn't feel right to you I'd listen to that now if you're in harmony mind and body if your known and unknown self are together I think you can pretty much trust what's going on but when those things separate then I think we do foolish things. Oh, Sensei said this world is not going well because people make friends with each other saying and doing foolish things. With whom then do I make friends? With the kami. Not only in my training, but in my daily life as well. And to me, this is the essence of what this is about. And it's knowing when, in the famous... Um, whenever I go to teach in other places, I often ask, you know, who's been in fights? And more often than not, it's in a bar. And usually what I'd say is on some level, someone's participated. There are rare cases where people are jumped or attacked randomly. Uh, and it does happen. I don't mean to minimize the importance of your ability to deal with that to whatever capability you develop. And I've studied quite a number of martial arts, but I call Aikido a Venusial art. Martial art is an art in the realm of Mars, the god of war. And a Venusial art is an art in the realm of Venus, the goddess of love. So let me ask you if you've left your connection to that impulse to breathe. And I'm hoping in saying it, you all of a sudden are paying attention to it again. And if you can feel the shift in your state of being when you're paying attention to it, as soon as you start to bring your attention in connection with it. Let me just pause for a second and say, are you with me? Are we making sense? Now I'd like to take you a step further into that and say, seek the origin, seek the source of the impulse to breathe. Not an imaginary, not an intellectual exercise. It's an experiential process of listening even deeper into that connection to the divine force of life. And I'll pause again to say, I, I know when I've traveled sometimes, people have said to me, in, uh, individuals, that they're not comfortable with the word divine. It brings back religious training and whatnot. I, I appreciate that. So I, I try not to use the word God too much. I, I use the force. I think we, we kind of can, with some humor, go there a little easier. But I have no problem with the word God, the word divine, the word the force, higher power, higher self, inner teacher, aikikami, uh, whatever it is that connects you with your bestowed mission. The Dalai Lama once said, we all have something in common. We all want to feel better. Nobody wants to feel worse. If you do that breathing, listening to the impulse to breathe and start unifying with it, let me ask, if there's someone that that makes them feel worse, stop me right now and tell me about it. Okay, so we did the 
I, uh, extraordinary listening breath and I've highlighted now for you seeking the source of that breath. If you ever have a moment where you quote unquote need help, just dealing with how you're feeling in a situation with your emotional state, anxiety, tension, anger, whatever it is, impatience, go immediately to the impulse to breathe and connect with it and listen to it. If you can get there, seek the source of it and if it ever doesn't work for you, write me and tell me what the story was. And if it works for you, I'd be happy to hear those stories too. But it's worked for me so much for so long. It's been so quintessential. And I emphasize it so much right now, folks, because I feel like uh, people hear the word kokinage, they don't know what we're talking about. Uh, they do a lot of formal techniques, ikkyo, nikkyo, shihonage, kodagaishi. But this jiawaza, kokyu, what we're connecting with is the origin of the source to breathe and we're connecting with that same force of life in our partner. As I say, I'm not activating their physical body. I'm not moving their physical body. I'm harmonizing with the energy force in them that moves their physical body. I've also had people talk about, you know, not believing in key or not understanding it or whatever. I would say in order to move your arm, you have to use the muscles in your body to move your arm. If you want to do that, you have to send a neural impulse through the nerves to the muscles. So we're moving our body with neural energy. And I think most people can get on a basic scientific understanding that energy is what activates the movement of the body and if we blend with that rather than trying to blend with the physical body even the momentum of the physical body which is an after effect and we start seeking something more original and that's why when Aikido is done well it looks so incredibly fake and a lot of times I think you know the ukes are being a little more compliant or something but we're not there to fight with each other, we're there to learn from each other. So tuning into this finer energy, this shift from working the uh, physical body to recognizing, oh, the physical body is moving by the muscles, oh, the muscles are moving by the neural energy. And then if you go a notch further, you start to recognize that the neural energy is activated by someone's intention. And I think that's closer to what we would term as key, mind intent, okay? I'm gonna pause just for a second. I'm saying a lot. If you're staying with the breath and you're listening in that state of unity, I think some of this is making sense, I hope. If not, you, I may be losing you. I don't wanna run on too fast, okay? But we talked about the breathing and I emphasize that it is the most important thing in your life is your breath. Take it away, it's the shortest route to death or the end of your existence as you know it. And when your breath is right, life feels right. And when you're trying to catch your breath or it's running away from you or you've lost touch with it, uh, life is stressful. It's a very different, different experience and that's true uh, like I say, making dinner, certainly trying to get along with your partners and uh, whoever you're under house arrest with and uh, co-workers and life in general. And I'd say if you come back to a harmonious relationship with your breath, you naturally express a more harmonious relationship with everyone else, thereby creating what Osensei called reciprocating echoes that we're always generating reciprocating echoes. And so if we're out of sorts with ourselves, then that naturally resonates with other people. And the more relaxed, the more open, the more positive our spirit, if that word or terminology works for you, the more we generate that in the people that we interact with and the more our life is that quality of experience. Okay, we talked about breathing at a level where you can hear it. 
I call it the audible breath. When your breath is moving at that level, your attention is more focused on what Osensei called the manifest realm. As you soften your breath, tune into it a little more, harmonize with it more, oxygenate at a more internal level because the breath moving in and out of the lungs is just phase one. Once it's in the lungs, it goes into the bloodstream. That's phase two. And from the bloodstream, it goes into the capillaries and exchanges oxygen with each individual cell. And that's phase three. And if you'll stay with the breathing for a minute and start to imagine or pretend that you can, feel the oxygen going into the cells. They kind of glow or I like the word smile. I don't know if that's fair. And you can feel some areas of the body tend to receive the oxygen more, others don't. Just by paying attention to that, you move out of sleep mode, like you do when you wake up your computer or cell phone or whatever, and everything lights up in a different way. As you start to notice it, you don't really have to do much about it. The energy starts Feeling more alive, feeling more vital, the oxygen starts to exchange more thoroughly or, or totally at the cellular level. Am I making sense? Are you with me? Do you have any questions? Practice it. As you soften your breath further, it goes from audible to silent. You can feel it, but you can't hear it. And usually after, and sometimes it's three, and sometimes it's ten. It's pretty rare that it's more than that, but it depends on the day. You s start to feel an even softer breath, and you're right on the edge of where you can't even feel it. I mean, your lungs are expanding, so your chest is expanding, and you know that you're breathing, but the uh, nasal passages or the, if you're breathing through the mouth, your throat, you don't feel the air moving. It's so gentle. And I like to play with the edge between where it's audible and where it's silent. And particularly with the edge where it's silent and then what I call invisible. So as you start to move from the audible breath, which tends to bring your attention at a level or dimension of what was essentially called the manifest, to the silent breath, you start to begin to perceive what was essentially called the hidden realm. That's where you start to be able to feel other people's energy. You can tell what's going on for them a bit. Now, if you lose connection with your own breath or the source of your breath or the impulse to breathe, you can start to imagine you feel their energy and make up stories that aren't true. But when you're really s centered into that experience, when you're alive and in touch with that experience, your sensitivity to other people increases dramatically and you can kind of feel what's behind the words, as it were, or the facial expressions or the uh, body posturing, uh, Whatever, whatever you're sensing. And as you go a few breaths more in the silent realm and soften it even a little more, you enter or come to the edge of that invisible realm. That's what Osensei called the divine realms or the origin of the creation. Now, these are ideas, these are thoughts and words until you've played with them for a while. And in the time we have today, you may not get to a level where you actually experience this. So I say again, just trust your inner teacher. If it doesn't sound right to you, don't buy it. If, if it does sound right to you, if your inner teacher says, oh yeah, I, I get that, well then your inner teacher says it's true. And if your inner teacher says, I don't know about that, let me think about it. As I say, please think about it. Okay, so the three breaths, audible, silent, invisible. 
taking you or opening more experientially the realms of the manifest hidden and divine. We did a Masogi breathing. It's basically an inhale through the nose and an exhale through the mouth with a HA sound. And I invite you to do two or three of those while I keep talking. Inhale all the way as far as is comfortable for you. And if you see the minus 10% sign up there, inhaling through the nose, they do a visualization of the air coming in over the top of the head, down the back of the spine, exhaling out the mouth with a And I think if you play with that a little bit, you start to notice how that affects the internal breathing. And they used to do a bit of that purification breath. Well, since they talked a lot about it, I'm going to speed through that one. Uh, it is in the last uh, video. If you want, uh, there'll be notes on it and I'm happy to talk with you more about it at another time. And there is one more breath I'd like to do very quickly and and I appreciate it may be short for some of you, but let's play with it. As you inhale, very softly, I want you to imagine your cells absorbing the breath. And so when you breathe out, you only breathe out a percentage, maybe half, maybe two-thirds of what you breathed in. And the rest of it goes into the cells. I call it the absorption breath. And I introduce it as something for you to play with. These are practices that I offer you because we're not going to spend that much time together. And they're the kind of practices that you can do on your own and they should connect you with your inner teacher. I've had a bunch of people ask me about the exercises, uh, specifics of how you should do them and whatnot. And I would say, again, happy to work with you on an individual level if you have these questions, but Generally, the way I direct you is go ahead and do them for a while and see what your connection to the Aikikami tells you is right for you. Just like when we listen to the impulse to breathe, it gives us a speed, as it were, a depth, a quality of breath. And it begins to move in or through us in its own way. And as you become more sensitive to that, you become your own teacher and that's probably what I'd like to share with you more than anything. And again, I come back to the impulse to breathe, the extraordinary listening breath is the main key to that. The way I teach yoga is three easy lessons. Oxygenation, which we've just spent, what, half an hour on? And the second phase is activation. We really focused on this last time. And I'm gonna stand up now and I'm gonna take my earpiece off so I may lose you. And if you have trouble hearing me, let me know. But basically, let's see if I can get this here. Really simply, three stretches, forward and back. Side to side, and you can stand up and do these with me, of course. And twist. Now we went over these at a greater depth last time. So again, I'm moving quickly, but there's something you should know in order to keep your spine alive, flexible, and most importantly, the neural pathways vitalize, to move the ki or the chi, as you will. Uh, these three stretches activate all the nerves that run through the spine and almost every nerve in the body comes off of the spine at some point. So this really activates the whole system. And between these three exercises, twisting, turning side to side, and I like to add the arm as part of the stretch, but if you listen to the inner voice, inner teacher, you'll get a sense of how far to move, how to play it, and of course the back and the forward. 
and you can combine them. You can turn side to side and twist a little bit. And as you start to do that, forward and back, and put the combinations together, you get virtually all the moves that you learn in the 108 poses of yoga. You'll get all the positions you'll do with any of the techniques, sorry, techniques we're going to do in Aikido, you know, our little Kota Gaishi here, whatever. Uh, all those moves are in this. So then you add the hands and the wrists and the elbows and the shoulders and you do your ikkyos and nikkyos and sankyos or just uh, hula, <laughs> hula dancing, whatever, whatever works best for you. And then I taught three articulations. And I'm going to move through them fairly quickly, but the head, forward and back, side to side, and twist. Then the shoulders, and I'm going to isolate the head and shoulders now, so I won't move my head separate. I just, my shoulders and my head will go a little bit. Twist. Side to side. And it won't be much movement, but forward and back. If you're still holding your torso and not moving your head, it's almost subtle. It's a it's very small amount of movement. Now, if we put the head and shoulders together, twist. But I'm still holding the torso fairly straight. Side to side. And forward and back. And then if we add the torso to it, the third articulation, and I'm going to hold the head and shoulders pretty uh, straight and just move the torso forward and back, side to side, and twist. I hope you're playing with this. And there is a video uh, on the Moon Sensei channel, Yoga in 3Z Lessons, that has all this in it. If you lose it, get back to me. And then we started playing with combining the three of them together. So the torso and the shoulders and the head. The torso, the shoulders, and the head. The torso, the shoulders, and the head. Okay? And you can play with them in any combination as you start to do that. And the way I look for it is just what feels good to you? What would be a good stretch? And once you've kind of gotten this pattern, you understand these variations, they can help you find places that you might not find in the beginning of your study. Once you're into the sensing of it, once you really connect with your breath and your somatic awareness, uh, this is where we go into our improv theater here. I say you pretend like you were just waking up from sleep. Uh, you, just, you, know, you, just, you know how you do it? You just move. Nobody's telling you what to do. You don't go study to do this. It just comes out of whatever you're feeling at the moment. And if you start to carry that a little bit and then adding, like we said, wrists, elbows, shoulders, along with the twists and the bends and the whatevers, you've got a pretty free-flowing kind of movement here. I want to stop. I'm going to put my earphones in for a second, come close, and ask how we're doing. Everybody's okay with this. Everybody's following it. Everybody can see how you could take this and play with it in your life. All right, so then the uh, things I want to play with here, I want to add one more technique. I would guess most of you would know it, but then again, I assume all this stuff is pretty common knowledge and I find out not for everyone. So if you know this, let's take it another notch. If it's new, play with it a little bit. Let's extend your arm and pull your arm back. 
Okay, basic and simple. All right, now keep pulling your arm back as you extend your arm. It's called isometrics. You work one muscle group against the other. And the degree of intensity with which you resist the movement as you create the movement strengthens your muscles to varying degrees. Stop yourself from rolling your wrists as you roll your wrists. So there's a lot of tension in the movement. All right, we want to go from this tense movement and I never was much going into the gym. I, uh, I always preferred isometrics and more the dance style of the movement because it does strengthen, but it also creates a fluidity and a power in it. And then you go back from this isometric quality where there's a lot of tension to the softest, most flowing quality of very lightness. And now I want to bring in the hips a little bit. And I'm going to exaggerate by moving the leg at the hip. And of course the knee. And then rolling the foot a little bit. So that you've got a whole body starting to play with these kinds of movements. And you find a pace that's right for you by listening to the feeling the same way you were listening to the impulse to breathe you listen to the impulse to move and I I like the dance aspect and last time we put on some music I'm not sure if we're gonna do that now but I'd add to it for those of you who want to practice Aikido I'm just gonna invite uh, one of my imaginary ukes to come in and do a showman strike here and I'm gonna move off the line and do an arimi nage. I've got someone now attacking from behind. I'm gonna do a two-step and a kota gaeshi. And if you want, go ahead and do the pin. Oh, I lost you there. Okay, so kokinage. Shihonage. Those of you who know any technique at all, no matter how new you are, you must learn one of them. Go ahead and practice that. So there's our basic introduction to the activation. Everybody good with the playfulness of the movement? If you play with your breath and you listen to your impulse to breathe and add your volition to it, you mix the um, known self with the unknown self. As you listen to the impulse to, breathe, uh, to move and you move in harmony with what feels good to you and then you work at higher degrees of resistance and tension to build strength and higher degrees of flexibility to build range of motion, you increase your capability and your personal power. Now I'd say, oh Sensei wanted us to have strength. He wanted us to be able to manifest the uniqueness of who we are in this world and that takes a, a strength, a courage, a power and that comes from you living truer and truer to who you are. So there's an ability to recognize what you need to do to take care of yourself and to have the courage to do what you know you need to do to take care of yourself. And it's very easy to disassociate and get lost because there's so much pressure in the world uh, in so many different ways that expect so much of you in certain kinds of uh, demanding ways that make it feel like you don't even remember what you were doing or what you thought or what you wanted. And that's why I come back to my first question was, What's important to you? Come back to that sense. What is it you want? Come back to that sense. So Sensei talked about peaceful reconciliation. The essence of Aikido is peaceful reconciliation. And he said peaceful reconciliation means allowing everyone the completion of their bestowed mission. And that means, and that's why I say, never lose touch with your inner teacher, with your own 
vital force, with your life force, with your connection to the divine force of life, so that you can do what you came to do. And I said, a teacher can help you, but a teacher should help you connect more with who you are. They should encourage you to become yourself. They shouldn't be trying to make you like them or believe what they believe necessarily. So that developing strength and power and capability, range of motion that we've played with in the physical, let's start to play with what that means in the realm of the spirit. It's an ability for you to know when you're in a situation you don't really want to be in or how to change a situation that you're in that you think should be different. This is not an external forcing. This is a unified field of awareness operating in harmony with the totality of the universe. So I teach yoga in 3Z lessons, oxygenate, activate, appreciate. It really means tuning in at a very subtle level to what you're feeling, connecting with your own experience, knowing when actually that wasn't what you wanted to eat tonight. You wanted to go to a different restaurant. You wanted a different kind of meal. You didn't want to eat right now. You did want to eat right now. And sometimes you can't always do everything you want. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, you stop for the red lights even if you do want to go. But you know where you want to go. You know what you'd like to do. You're in touch with that inner source of, that manifests you in the world. And so this flexibility in the body that you develop becomes a flexibility in the mind and an ability to work and harmonize with people of different opinions and different attitudes and to find a way to work with the diversity and the complexity of the universe without losing that same central connection that is the impulse that breathes your life, the impulse of life that breathes you, the you that you truly are. And I joke about coming out of a movie that you just thought was terrible and the person you're with goes, God, wasn't that a great movie? And at that point, what do you say? You know, no, it wasn't. Or do you say, oh, yes, it was? And I'd say, well, if you really came back to yourself and you were really okay with yourself, you wouldn't need to say any of those things. You'd be in a position where you'd be able to say to them, sincerely, what did you like about it? And you'd be engaged in a harmonious conversation with them, even though your opinions might have been vastly different. It doesn't become about right and wrong. Aikido doesn't call relative affairs good or bad, but keeps all beings in a constant state of growth and development and serves for the completion of the universe. Maybe a good point to double check in. Are we making a little shift between how we do these physical practices and how they begin to apply to our psychic emotional self, to our spiritual being, to our state of connection to the universe? Stay with the impulse to breathe. If you're feeling like sitting still, sit still. If you feel like moving, go ahead and move. Play with that for a minute on your own and we'll move into the last phase of our study for today. And I was just enjoying, in a funny way, those things that seemingly are unresolvable to a certain level of your being. But at another level of your being, there really isn't any problem. And the ability to be in both places at once is exactly where I want to go next. Oh, Sensei talked about the floating bridge of heaven. He talked endlessly about the floating bridge of heaven. One of the students, what they call Deshi, one of the people who trained with O-Sensei, said, O-Sensei always emphasized that you must stand on the floating bridge of heaven. If you do not stand on the floating bridge of heaven, Aikido will not come forth. And then he said, but we didn't know where this floating bridge was and we didn't know how to stand on it. So we just put on a good face and we kept applying three techniques to each other. All right. So
So here's what I want to say, and I'm going to say this again, and I, I think I said at the beginning that these are my stories. And you have to play with your own experience to see if they're true for you. Never abandon your inner teacher, but this is what I think. I think that that's where the art got lost and that people went out and taught applying techniques to each other and putting on a good face. And they thought that somehow if you kept practicing Nikkyo, you'd reconcile the world and make human beings one family or whatever all the spiritual stuff he talked about was. But I think it was a misunderstanding. He was a martial artist. That was how he came into his realm of consciousness. I don't think most of us are. And I don't think from what I understand and from my conversations with Bob and particularly about his conversations with O Sensei, that O Sensei wanted us to become martial artists. I think what he was saying is if you catch on to what I'm doing here, you can be as good in whatever it is that you do as I am as a martial artist. And let me show you how exceptional this is. And if you've seen the videos where he's got eight guys or he's holding the, the staff out to the side and five guys are pushing on it and can't move it. And, uh, you know, it wasn't parlor tricks. He wasn't showing off. He was saying, we can transcend the limits of what we expect. And that ability to be present in the physical reality that we exist in, uh, get our taxes in on time or whatever the personal issues are that you have, look after your kids, uh, take good care of your body or your house or your family, and at the same time envision this possibility of something beyond the comprehension of where you exist connected only to the manifest realm. Something dramatically different is possible. And if you've ever tried uh, just holding your arm out and having somebody with one finger move your arm, uh, you'll see that it's, it's virtually impossible. Try to imagine a five-foot staff and five guys pushing on it. And it, it's like, what was he doing? And again, I don't think he was trying to show off. I think he was saying, you could reach an amazing level in your own world if you understand these principles. And I would say that the basic principle is one plus one equals one. The two aspects, everything that you know, and everything that you don't know are one system. For most of us, Everything that we don't know is overwhelming and we're resistant to it and we hold tighter and tighter to our identity. But as you start to recognize a comfort with that, I think Carl, you know, if, I, if I'm catching it right, that seeming confusion that shows up when the two start to merge, uh, something starts to shift there. And here's, here's the way I'd like to talk about it. The two forces the aspect of yourself that you know. You know what you like, you know who you like, you know who you don't like. You, you, you think you know things about yourself in that way. Um, as you start to tap into the rest of yourself, the part of you that connects with the totality of the universe, and if you picture an iceberg, there's a little bit above the water, and there's a lot more below the water, and the whole thing sits suspended in this universal ocean of cosmic energy, all of which is part of what you are. You can't remove yourself from it. You can't exist without it. And as you start to, and at first it's just an imaginary game, you know, you think about it or something like that, but if you're playing with the listening breath, then it becomes experiential your attention and your experience connect as you pay attention to this being part of a totality and you start to experience yourself even infinitely more, I mean uh, infinitesimally more, as part of a larger universe, who you are changes. 
So there's you, and let's just say you're having a problem with your energy. I like to get it when I'm trying to do something mechanical. I'm not a mechanical person, and I get frustrated very easily with the, the weed whacker or the, what, you know, the tools or those kinds of things, with my computer, with whatever. And the energy starts to increase. As Bob's always taught so beautifully since the beginning, as soon as you have a situation, energy comes in response to the situation your system automatically draws on more universal energy because you need it. But if you're holding your identity to the same size, calling up more energy in the same size pipe and starts to, increase the, starts to increase the pressure and you start to feel more pressure, maybe more tense, maybe more anxious, maybe more angry, maybe more helpless, maybe more uh, sad. It just depends on the situation and your personal tonality and the habits that you've created. Like when a soft hillside is hit by rain and the rain starts to pour down the hillside, it carves gullies in the hillside. And then every time it rains, the water tends to go down those same gullies. And we make thought patterns and f uh, what we call thoughts and feeling patterns, what David Bohm called felts, where we've just habituated to feeling such a way that almost any stimulus triggers that particular tonality. As we start to increase the energy, it flows down those channels. As you play with this game of connecting your known with your unknown, your volitional breath with the universal aspect that's breathing you, your system naturally opens. And so I'm going to go into a quick meditation practice. Three seconds. One second of aligning. And again, we'll start with the physical. Aligning your physical structure. And as you do, your musculature starts to support your body more. And the, I'm sorry, your skeletal structure starts to support your physical body more and your musculature can relax. So align, allow, and then appreciate what happens as you do that. You can feel the energy in your system flowing more openly, more freely. If we're going to start there, you're a little less whatever emotion you might have been pouring that energy into. But the energy is first, and then you form it into whatever you do with your life. So, as you align, allow, appreciate, if you keep playing with that in the physical, it takes three seconds, and that means you can do it again a couple seconds later, and you could do it many times during the day, and even by drops the bucket is filled, you'll find that you just tend to align with yourself more. You start to naturally be more who you are. You, uh, Take better care of yourself, as it were, and as a result, you live in a better spirit and you create better reciprocating echoes with everyone you interact with. You generate greater harmony in the world. Now, since I said rely on harmony to activate your manifold powers, it's like when you get out of harmony with yourself, and let's take public speaking for one, which most people put higher on their fear list than death. Uh, if you're up in front of a group of people, you can forget what you wanted to say. It can get to the point where you can't remember your name. You stutter. You can't, you know, whereas if you're with a friend, you just hang out and talk. As you get more comfortable with yourself, you're more naturally yourself. Learning how to do that in higher and higher pressure situations so that you can bring that quality and generate that reciprocating echo in the world and help everyone else do that. If everyone in the symphony were playing their part perfectly, what a beautiful symphony it would be. If everyone stuttering and forgetting their part and playing off key or out of phase with who they really are, all these reciprocating tensions start to exist. So returning to this source of your being that actually is your being, this is what I understand as an approach to standing on the floating bridge. I don't want to say it is the floating bridge, but 
last exercise here. I'm going to move out again so you can watch me. And I hope you can hear me okay. But one of the things that I do with my imaginary ukes is I have them try and lift me up. And I just extend my energy, if you've ever played with these unliftable games, and I get quote unquote heavier. Obviously I still weigh the same, but because my energy is connected deeper with the center of the earth, I'm in a different relationship to gravity. I'm in a different relationship to the planet. The planet being part of the universe, I'm in a different relationship to the universe. And so when I practice my guitar, particularly I, I'm practicing classical guitar again, I try and have that sense where somebody couldn't lift my elbow, where I'm, I'm actually settled as I'm practicing. I do that when I practice my Joe moves. And I think I'll maybe show you one last piece here. Um, in terms of the sword motion, uh, when we bring the sword into this inverted pose for this particular strike, I want to show you that if you just let go and your wrist is pretty loose, the sword sort of naturally does that. It takes very little effort at all to do that movement. I mean, almost none. And then like we did with the Aiki dance breath of bringing your volition to that inner force, as you connect to this natural force with your force, then all of a sudden I think you start to see uh, an incredible speed and power in the movement of the sword. And I don't know how many of us really care about our sword movement that much. I don't know when the last time you were in a sword fight was, but if you can get this principle, I think you can start to bring that to bear in your relationship with the people you love and the people that matter to you especially and it naturally starts to flow out into everyone that you interact with. So I think that's the basic layout of connecting those two is what I would say is an approach and we'll try and focus on this next week as the main emphasis of standing on the floating bridge or being in a state where you're in harmony with the universe. You're actually connected to the gravity of the earth and as O-sensei said, the singing of the birds and you know, at home with the stars and this whole spiritual transformation, which I'm guessing most of us were here for. And probably not that many of us, although I'm sure we'd all like more physical capability and power, more strength, <clears throat> more strength to protect those we love. Um, it's all part of a larger sense. And if you go back over the writings of O-sensei, there's very, very, very little about how to do a proper technique. And almost everything he talks about is how to become yourself, to accomplish your bestowed mission, to live in harmony with the universe and to bring that into creating a one world family or peace on earth or, you know, which I'm assuming most of us are here for. And if you weren't, you probably would have already left the class, so. I'd like to take a few minutes before we wrap up here and just go quickly into the breath. Align, allow, appreciate on the physical. Align with the breath or listen to the impulse to breathe. Allow it and appreciate what that feels like as you soften from the audible to the silent from the silent to the invisible. And as you align with yourself in that invisible or divine realm and appreciate as you allow yourself to be who you are, how that feels to you. And if we were in the dojo and we were practicing movements and I could get a chance to play with you physically and show you how doing this internal practice completely transforms the quality of your interaction with your uke, which really just represents the rest of the universe. I trained once with Mr. Saito, who you know pretty much talks about all the physical, technical stuff. And I think as such, his students came to understand him that way. But what I asked him when he finished class 
And they were asking questions about how do you do Ikkyo against a tall person and stuff like that. I said, what's the essence of Aikido? And what's the purpose of training? And he said, oh, Sensei taught from the very beginning that the essence of Aikido was, and then, of course, he used some word which was translated as non-resistance or harmony. And I'd come back to that movement with the sword. And I'd say, it's, as the sword represents the movement of the universe, then I would say it's working in harmony with it the way I hope you saw me working in harmony with the sword, and just a brief and kind of a rough demonstration, that the essence of Aikido is being in harmony with the energies that you're working with. And that could be someone in a conversation, that could be working together. I like to play music, so I, I play in a band a lot, and nothing's more important than that there. But, you know, working when I did carpentry, working with guys trying to build a house. It doesn't really matter what the game is. And he said, the purpose of training is to become one with your partner. And I would translate that to mean become one with the universe. Oh, since they said all the problems in this world exist because people have forgotten that everything emanates from a single source. Calm the spirit, return to the source. And you know when you've done a good technique with your partner in Aikido, it's relatively effortless in the sense that it feels like what you're doing is not forcing anyone to do anything, but you're actually helping them accomplish their bestowed mission as you accomplish yours. It's not a matter of winning and losing. So on that note, I'd say stand on the floating bridge. You must stand on the floating bridge or Aikido will not come forth. And now, let me be perfectly honest with you, I have no idea what that means. But, I've spent the last, I don't know how many years, opening myself to understanding that. I didn't not pay attention to that as if it didn't matter. I didn't just go and practice techniques and put on a good face. I left myself open to that mystery, and Carl, here's where I hope I'm touching some of what you were asking on. To just stay in the wonder, stay in the openness to that, and even though you have the sense of not understanding it, you're actually okay with that. The whole thing becomes a, an opening to a universal magic, mystery, divinity, um, kami, whatever word works for you at that point. And if God works for you, fine. Being in harmony with God, doesn't that sound good if you're in that, if you can use that word that way? So there's where I'm going to leave my conversation of entering this pathway, this approach to the floating bridge. And I'll bring up a term here, what I call the unified field of being. As they use in science the term the unified field theory to define the creation and we'll explore these two things. That's where we'll focus most of next week. I can't encourage you enough to practice the listening breath. Play with the other forms, the Aiki dance breath, the Masogi breath. Play with when you're sitting around, you know, watching a movie, when you're waiting for your tea water to boil, when you're listening to somebody who's teaching and they're boring. Um, play with the silent breath. Play with the invisible breath. Notice where you're at in those realms. And when no one's watching, or when you could do like Rumi said, I want to sing like the birds sing, without caring what it sounds like or who's listening, do some movements. Just do anything that feels good to you at the moment and see if you can play with the idea that you've got imaginary ukes trying to lift you up you know, pick you up or something like that, and you're settling down and you're doing your movements and they can't lift you. What would that feel like? And I think if you stay in the imagination enough, you'll find that it has tremendous power in terms of your training and when you go back to 
doing it with physical ukes and you you know in hopes that we do get to go back to play in a more actual realm i think you'll find this kind of training stands you in really good stead he said the people want heaven they don't know they are heaven now it's just an honor to be with you all and, and get to share some of what's important to me and hope that you can take something to help you find what's important to you. Thank you all for being here. I hope to see you next week.